Today's topic is about using eigenvectors as a basis. So the very first thing we need to do is figure out what it means to use a different basis than the one we currently have. And this leads us to the similarity transform and a change of basis. So consider the following. Suppose I have a coordinate system and let's say it starts here at the origin where the two white arrows meet. The x-axis runs along the bottom of the figure. The y-axis points straight up in this figure. And suppose that for some reason we would like to use a different basis. Here, the first arrow points at a castle. And the second arrow points at a summer residence in this particular town. And so it might be useful to use those to direct visitors around. What this means is that suppose we have some point that we want to direct them to, say somewhere around here. We have a point that in our current coordinate system has coordinates x1 and x2, and we have two new coordinate vectors, the white vectors, s1 tilde and s2 tilde, and we want to use those to describe that same point. So we now have a new set of coordinates, x1 tilde, x2 tilde, and the relationship between all of these is that our original point, the coordinates of our original point, wherever it is, are now going to be rewritten as some multiplier, x1 tilde, along the s1 tilde axis, plus some multiplier, x2 tilde, along the s2 tilde axis. So what this is, is an ax equals b type of problem. Maybe we know what xp is, we know what s1 tilde and s2 tilde are, and we want to know what x1 tilde and x2 tilde might happen to be. And so we have a matrix made up of the new coordinate vectors times the new multipliers on those coordinate vectors equal to x1, x2 equal to our current point. The choices that we make, well, the new coordinate vectors, uh, those white vectors, should be linearly independent, and what that does is that makes S invertible. So switching from our old representation, our original representation of the point P, to our new representation of that point P, is actually just this substitution, that XP is replaced by S, X tilde P, or similarly, since S is invertible, then I get the new coordinates from the old coordinates by multiplying by that S inverse matrix. The columns of that matrix S are our new coordinate vectors, so the new directions that we want expressed in the original coordinate system. So let's look at a quick example. Suppose we have a point P, and that point P is expressed in terms of an old coordinate system, so it's expressed as a linear combination of the vectors i and j, and we now wish to express it as a linear combination of the vectors s1 tilde, s2 tilde. Sorry, I lost the tilde there. So uh, the way that might look, therefore, is in the original coordinate system, our point xp has a coordinate vector, x1, x2. Let's say it's 1, 6. In that old coordinate system, we want two new directions, s1 tilde and s2 tilde, and they have coordinates 3, 2, and minus 3, 3 in this original ij coordinate system. Then the new coordinates, the multipliers on s1 and the multiplier on s2, so that that multiplier s1 plus that multiplier s2 adds up to the point p, satisfies, well, the first vector, 3, 2, as the first column, the second vector, minus 3, 3, as the second column, times that new coordinate vector for the point p, is equal to the current coordinate vector for the point P. So if I substitute that, if I multiply that out, what I find is that the original coordinates, x1 and x2, can be written as a linear combination of the new coordinates, x1 tilde and x2 tilde. So if I have an expression involving x1 and x2, this is just a substitution of the x tilde variance. Let's now look what this might imply when we have a function, a linear transformation. So let's start with the matrix A and let's make it square and look at the linear transformation y is equal to ax that takes a vector x in Rn 
and transforms it to a vector y in Rn. And since we chose the domain and the codomain to be the same, we can choose the same new set of bases both in the domain and the codomain. So we can let x equal to sx tilde, y is equal to sy tilde, where the columns of that matrix S are the new directions, the new vectors for our coordinate system that we want to choose. Now, when we substitute that into y is equal to ax, we can solve in terms of y tilde and x tilde. And what we see is that that matrix A changes to a new matrix S inverse AS. So this expression S inverse AS is nothing but our geometrical transformation A written in terms of a new coordinate system. Well, that leads us to a definition. If I have two matrices A and B of the same size N by N, then we'll say that they're similar if there exists an invertible matrix S such that B can be written in terms of A as S inverse AS. And such a transformation is called a similarity transformation. And what it really says is that the geometrical description of A and the geometrical description of B are the same. Let's look at an example. So suppose I have the projection onto the X1 axis. I can easily write down the transformation. It's just y is equal to ax, and a is, we'll keep the x component, and we'll zero out the y component. Let's use a new set of axes for this transformation. Let's simply rotate the current axis by pi over 4. So what that does is the following. I have a rotation matrix R that expresses that change of coordinates. Those are my new directions for my new axis. And therefore, I can compute the projection matrix with respect to these new axes. And when I multiply it out, I get the projection matrix onto, well, my axis originally was the x1 axis. It's rotated to the bisector, to the vector 1, 1, scaled appropriately. And you will recognize this as the projection matrix onto the line y equals x. Now, let's ask ourselves what happens to an eigenpair when I change coordinates. Here is the theorem. If I take a square matrix A that happens to have an eigenvector x and the corresponding eigenvalue lambda, and I take some new basis for Rn, and therefore I can compute the similar matrix A tilde. Well, what was the interpretation of lambda and x to begin with? x was a special direction such that the transformation a applied to that vector in that special direction just multiplied that vector by that constant lambda. If I change my coordinate system, that geometrical transformation should be the same. So I still expect to have special directions that get multiplied by that eigenvalue lambda. And if my special direction in the original basis was x, well, that special direction in a new basis will be whatever it happens to be, namely S inverse X, according to what we've just seen. So geometrically, it sounds obvious that this should hold. So let's look at it algebraically. Algebraically, we are seeing this. We have this matrix A, and we're doing a substitution. X is equal to SX tilde for a new basis made up of the columns of S. And therefore, if AX is equal to lambda X, and we do the substitution, we substitute for X, we can push the S inverse to the other side, and we end up with the similarity transformation of A in terms of this new basis of the columns of S equal to lambda X tilde. But that's just the new representation of the matrix times the new representation of that eigenvector equal to the same eigenvalue times that new representation of that eigenvector. Next question, therefore, what if I choose eigenvectors for my transformation, for my new basis? So let's look at this special case. And let's make it simple. Let's start with a 2 by 2 example. Here is a matrix A, 6, 10, minus 2, minus 3, mm -hmm. and we'll run our eigen decomposition. So the first step is to find the roots. We set up the characteristic polynomial. We compute the roots, and therefore we see the factorization that lambda equals 1 and lambda equals 2 are eigenvalues. 
We now go to step two, finding the basis for the eigenvalues. So for that first eigenvalue, lambda is equal to one, a minus i has rho echelon form one, two, zero, zero. Indeed, we see a missing pivot. And when we compute the basis for that null space, we see the vector minus two, one. Going to case lambda equals two, a similar computation yields a basis vector minus five, two. So in summary, we have two eigenvalues, one and two, each occurring with algebraic multiplicity one. And for lambda equals one, we have an eigenvector basis minus two, one. For lambda equals two, we have an eigenvector basis minus five, two. The next step, therefore, is using those eigenvectors as an eigenvector basis. I have two eigenvectors here, and if you check, you'll see that, yes, they're linearly independent, so they should make two good directions. So let S, therefore, be made up of the eigenvectors written in as columns, and let's compute the similarity transform of A. And when we do, we end up with a diagonal matrix. So should we have predicted this? First of all, linearly independent basis. There's a theorem that actually guarantees that they're independent, namely eigenvectors for different eigenvalues are linearly independent. Let's see what this looks like in the algebra. Suppose I have two eigenpairs, an eigenvalue lambda one with eigenvector x one and an eigenvalue lambda two and an eigenvector x two for a square matrix A, such that the eigenvalues are different. And what I want to do is check the linear independence of x1 and x2. So we have to set up our linear combination alpha 1 x1 plus alpha 2 x2 equals 0. We have to ask what kind of solution for alpha 1 and alpha 2 we can get. So let's take this equation and multiply it to the left by a. Then we get alpha 1 a x1 plus alpha 2 a x2 equals 0. And since x1 and x2 are eigenvectors, this multiplies out to this particular expression. I can also take my equation here and multiply it by lambda 2. Therefore, I get a very similar expression. I get the same lambda 2s on the right of multiplying x2, but I get different lambdas, lambda 1 and lambda 2 multiplying x1. So if I take the difference of these two equations now, I find alpha 1 lambda 2 minus lambda 1 times x1 is equal to 0. Well, x1 is an eigenvector and therefore is not 0. What that means is the only way that I can get the 0 vector out of this is if alpha 1 times lambda 2 minus lambda 1 is equal to 0. But we said that lambda 1 and lambda 2 are different. Therefore, alpha 1 is equal to 0. And I can make the same kind of argument by multiplying by lambda 1, or actually just plugging in alpha 1 equal to 0 here, that leaves alpha 2 times an eigenvector is equal to 0. And therefore, the eigenvectors are indeed independent. So the eigenvectors that we write into our summary tables, they're always going to be independent since we choose the null spaces, the basis for the null spaces, those vectors to be linearly independent to begin with. Well, with that out of the way, let's go after the fact that we ended up with a diagonal matrix. Suppose I take my eigenvectors, that basis of eigenvectors, and I write them into a matrix as columns. In other words, I'm setting up the change of basis matrix S. And let's see what it means when I multiply a times one of the basis vectors, since a times any one of those basis vectors is equal to the corresponding lambda times that basis vector. What I get when I multiply a into this matrix S, I get a times x1 is lambda 1x1, a times x2 is lambda 2x2, etc., all the way to lambda k x k. And then I can recognize that this column here is a column multiplied by lambda 1, second column is multiplied by lambda 2, last column is multiplied by lambda k, I can recognize, I can rewrite it like this. That same matrix S, x1, is multiplied by that first column, lambda 1 times x1 plus 0 times x2 plus 0 times x3 is lambda 1 x1. Similarly, 0 times x1 plus lambda 2 x2 
gives me the lambda 2 x2 term in my original expression. And therefore, I end up with a diagonal matrix of eigenvalues to the right. So what this looks like is that if S is made up of eigenvectors, then multiplying A into S yields S times lambda. So AS is equal to S times lambda. That lambda matrix is diagonal, and the eigenvalues corresponding to the eigenvectors sit on the diagonal. Well, that leaves one last question. In order for S to be invertible, I have to have enough vectors. So let's look at an example that shows us that it's not always true. Bad news. So the eigenvectors are linearly independent. Therefore, S has a pivot in every column. But to be invertible, it has to be square. So for example, for a two by two example that had the two eigenvectors in the basis, the one we just did above, but we had an invertible matrix S. However, look at this matrix. A is equal to 10, 1, 0, 10. And so in step one, well, it's actually easy. My matrix is triangular. So P of lambda is lambda minus 10 squared. So lambda is an eigenvalue 10 that occurs twice. When I try and compute the null space, A minus 10i has a null space of dimension 1. The homogeneous solution has a single vector in it. And as a consequence, I don't have enough vectors. I would need two vectors to make that matrix S square. So we now know that we might be able to diagonalize matrices. So let's look at that in more detail. The basic theory for diagonalizable matrices, therefore, goes as follows. Suppose I have a matrix A, a square of size n by n, and suppose it has n linearly independent eigenvectors. So I have enough eigenvectors. I have as many eigenvectors as there are columns in that matrix. And let the lambdas be the associated eigenvalue. We are going to form the matrix of eigenvectors for our change of basis matrix S, eigenvalue x1, x2 through xn written in as columns, and a corresponding diagonal matrix lambda that has the eigenvalues on the diagonal. So the eigenvalue for x1 sits in the first position on the diagonal for the second vector x2, lambda 2 is in the second column, all the way to xn where lambda n is in the last column. Then what we have seen is that if we compute a times s, that that turns out to be s times lambda. And since we have n eigenvectors in Rn that are linearly independent, we know that the matrix S is invertible, and therefore we can solve for either lambda or for A. If we solve for lambda, what we see is that the diagonal eigenvalue matrix is similar to A. Namely, it is A rewritten in the basis made up of the eigenvectors. The definition, therefore, is that a matrix A is diagonalizable, or also called non-defective, if there exists an invertible matrix S, such that the similarity transform of A with that matrix S is diagonal. Otherwise, the matrix is defective. And the theorem that goes with that is that the only way that I can find such an invertible matrix S is if I make it up of all n linearly independent eigenvectors. So A is diagonalizable if and only if I have n linearly independent eigenvectors, and then S is the only type of matrix that will diagonalize the matrix A. The only caveat here is that the order in which I write the eigenvectors into the matrix is flexible. So there is not unique matrix S. The order of the eigenvectors can change, and I can scale the eigenvectors as well. So. We've already seen one example where we couldn't diagonalize a matrix A. And the reason we couldn't diagonalize that matrix was that we did not have enough linearly independent eigenvectors. In order to be diagonalizable, whatever the size of the matrix N by N is, I need to have that many linearly independent eigenvectors. And these linearly independent eigenvectors will form a basis for Rn. That brings us to why algebraic multiplicities are important.
what we have is the following theorem. If I start with a square matrix of size n by n, and I pick an eigenvalue for that matrix, let's say lambda, and I'll look at the algebraic multiplicity of that eigenvalue, then I'm guaranteed the following. The null space of a minus lambda i, that is the eigenspace associated with that eigenvalue lambda, we're guaranteed that there will be at least one eigenvector because we set up lambda so as to have a free variable in a minus lambda i. Therefore, there's a lower bound, one, we'll have at least one basis vector. This theorem says that there's also an upper bound, and that upper bound is the algebraic multiplicity of that eigenvalue. Since we need n eigenvectors, and we can get at most algebraic multiplicity of eigenvectors out of any eigenvalue lambda, and since all of the multiplicities add up to n, what that says is the moment I have an eigenvalue uh, where the dimension of E lambda is not equal to the algebraic multiplicity, I will not have a diagonalizable matrix. A is diagonalizable if and only if the dimension of the eigenspace associated with lambda is equal to the algebraic multiplicity for that eigenvalue for all of the eigenvalues of A. So that dimension of the eigenspace of the null space of A minus lambda I is now an interesting quantity. It's called the geometric multiplicity of the eigenvalue. So the geometric multiplicity is the dimension of the null space of A minus lambda I. And the theorem that goes with it is that that geometric multiplicity must equal to the algebraic multiplicity for every eigenvalue. If yes, then my matrix is indeed diagonalizable. If no, if any one of those has fewer eigenvectors in it, that matrix is not diagonalizable. So in summary then, what does our new table look like? When we add the basis of eigenvectors, the, the matrix cap S and the matrix of eigenvalues. So look at this particular matrix. A is equal to 0, 2, minus 1, 3. And what we'll do is we'll change our table. So here, this is what we find. An eigenvalue 1 with multiplicity 1 and a single basis vector 2, 1. So yes, we are guaranteed that that eigenspace here has at least one vector in it and at most one vector. Here it is. Similarly, an eigenvalue 2 with multiplicity 1. Again, we are guaranteed that we have exactly one eigenvector in our basis. It is this time around an eigenvector 1, 1. And we're going to construct lambda and s from it. The lambda matrix has the eigenvalues on the diagonal. So we are going to make sure we are consistent. We're going to copy down the current eigenvalue of each one of these and place them on successive rows in our diagonal matrix lambda. And we're also going to copy down the corresponding eigenvectors. So for eigenvalue 1, it's the eigenvector 2, 1. For eigenvalue 2, it's the eigenvector 1, 1 that goes into our S matrix. Notice that these matrices are not unique. I could have chosen to write my lambdas in the opposite order. I could have chosen 2, 1. What happens is that the overall expression S inverse A, S, multiplies out to the corresponding eigenmatrix lambda, regardless of the order. Now, geometrically, what we see is that we have two eigenvectors, an eigenvector x1 and an eigenvector x2, and we can look at some point x in our space, and we can ask what happens to that vector x if we apply a to it. Well, we can decompose x into a linear combination of our eigenvectors, and therefore write x in that new basis. I made it simple here in this expression. The corresponding coefficients are just 1 and 1. So that vector x gets broken up into 1 times x1 plus 1 times x2. 1 times x1 is eigenvalue 1, so when I apply a to 1x1, it doesn't change. I'm always going to be parallel to the x2 vector. The component along x2, however, that has eigenvalue lambda equals 2. So a component along this axis, when we apply a to it, 
changes it by a factor of two. The overall effect, therefore, is to take point x into the point y, where the component along x2 for that vector y was multiplied by a factor of two, and the component along x1 was multiplied by a factor of one. And this is, therefore, the point that we're going to end up at. With a three by three table, well, here's an example of a three by three table. I found two eigenvalues, lambda equals two and lambda equals zero. Two had algebraic multiplicity two, zero had algebraic multiplicity one. When I compute the basis for the null spaces of A minus lambda I for the eigenvalue two, I indeed found two basis vectors. Well, I knew I was going to get either one or two. I got two. And therefore, we have the number of basis vectors required. For the eigenvalue 0, multiplicity 1, I know I have to find exactly one vector, and this is the basis vector that I pulled out from the computation. So I have three eigenvectors, linearly independent eigenvectors, in R3. They form a basis for R3. When I now copy down the eigenvalues, well, 2 gets copied down twice. I have two eigenvectors. Zero gets copied down exactly once. The corresponding eigenvectors also get copied down in the exact same order. So here, this matrix lambda is the diagonal form of that matrix A that I have started with in this example. And the matrix S is the coordinate transformation matrix to switch from our original coordinate system to the system of eigenvectors. Incidentally, this example is the one that we ended the last lecture with. Another example here, I again have an eigenvalue 2, I again have an eigenvalue 0, the algebraic multiplicities were 2 and 1, but this time, when I did the decomposition, when I found the basis vectors, I only found a single eigenvector for eigenvalue 2. And to be diagonalizable, I should have had two eigenvectors here. I only have one. Therefore, I can conclude that there is no diagonal matrix for the matrix that I started with. The eigenvalue 2 has a geometric multiplicity 1 and an algebraic multiplicity 2. They are not the same, therefore this matrix is defective. It can't be diagonalized. Let's next look at some special cases. One of them that can arise is complex eigenvalues. Well, we'll make it simple. We'll just look at one example without going into too much detail. Here is a matrix, and when we write down the characteristic polynomial of that matrix, this is what we get. An eigenvalue lambda is equal to 1. And then this quadratic polynomial, when we find the roots, we find complex roots, a pair of complex conjugate roots, 1 minus 3i and 1 plus 3i. And we do the computations as before, but now there's complex numbers involved. And when we run that computation, this is what we end up. We have an eigenvalue 1, it occurs once, the corresponding eigenvector is 0, 0, 1. The eigenvalue 1 minus 3i, the corresponding eigenvector is 1 minus i is 0, and the complex conjugate of that eigenvalue, 1 plus 3i, and the corresponding complex conjugate of the eigenvector, 1i0. Pulling the lambdas down into our lambda matrix, well, the lambda matrix now has complex entries in it, 1 minus 3i and 1 plus 3i, and pulling down the corresponding eigenvectors into the matrix S, again, we now have complex entries in that matrix S. But when we write down a is equal to s inverse lambda s, if we multiply it out, the theory guarantees that we'll get a. And a started out with real coefficients only. So all of these complex numbers, all of these i terms in here, must cancel out in this multiplication. One can look at the algebra and try and figure out what the real part of that computation is. The imaginary part will drop out. And when one does, one finds that, see this, the complex conjugates of the eigenvalues? Well, when I try and figure out what the real parts do, I lose the fact that this matrix was diagonal. I'll get 
a little two by two matrix with entries both on the diagonal and on the off diagonal. It looks like this. I have a real part and an imaginary part of lambda, a real part minus that imaginary part of lambda. And when I try and figure out matrix A, it gives me a matrix that looks like this. So the real part of lambda, imaginary part of lambda, minus the imaginary part of lambda and the real part of lambda. And you might recognize that from linear transformations. That's just the scale factor that I can pull out of there. The scale factor is the magnitude of the complex number lambda. And the remaining matrix is a rotation by the angle associated with that complex number lambda. So complex values, when they crop up, turn out to be rotations in addition to just the scale multiplier that we had for real values. One last topic in this section, under what conditions a matrix diagonalizable? Look at the matrix A, could I predict that it is diagonalizable? There's no general theorem, but there are two special cases that occur quite frequently in practice. The first one is, suppose I have a matrix A and it doesn't have eigenvalues that occur more than once. So no repeated eigenvalues. Well, that means that all of the algebraic multiplicities are equal to one. That means that all of the associated null spaces are equal to one. Such a matrix will indeed be diagonalizable. So if I look at this example over here, A is equal to, it's a triagonal matrix, and therefore two and three are the eigenvalues. And the associated eigenvectors, there's going to be one for each, one zero and one one in this particular case. And so my matrix is indeed diagonalizable. A square matrix of dimension n by n that has n distinct eigenvalues, none of them repeated, is therefore diagonalizable. The second important case is symmetric matrices. Matrices that look like A is equal to A transpose. So symmetric matrices turn out to be quite special. We're going to extend this theorem a little bit later. So here's that preliminary version that we have. If I start with a matrix A of the real coefficient and it is symmetric, then two things happen automatically. One is that matrix A is guaranteed to be diagonalizable. The other thing that happens is that the eigenvalues and eigenvectors are real. There's no rotations here, no complex numbers, just a real decomposition. So A is diagonalizable. It's actually a special case of a more general theorem. But the special case is if my matrix A satisfies A times A transpose is equal to A transpose A, meaning I can interchange A and A transpose and then multiply out to the same matrix, then such a matrix is diagonalizable. And so we give this a name. We say that the matrix is normal if and only if A, a transpose is equal to A transpose A examples of such matrices. Well, symmetric matrices are normal. Therefore, symmetric matrices are diagonalizable. Well, we already know that. Skew symmetric matrices, once where I take the transpose and I find the negative of the matrix A, they satisfy that condition. They are diagonalizable. And the third important category is that if the inverse of that matrix A happens to be the transpose of A, they satisfy that condition as well. The such matrices are diagonalizable. They'll be called orthogonal matrices, and we're going to be studying them later. Why do we want this? Well, one important application is it lets us compute the powers of a diagonalizable matrix. Look at the following. First of all, if my matrix happens to be diagonal, then raising it to some power, you simply multiply that matrix by itself p times, we'll find lambda 1 to the p, lambda 2 to the p, lambda k to the p, if my matrix is size k by k. So let us now look at a diagonal matrix example. If I take a diagonal matrix here with entries 1, minus 1, 3, 2, and raise it to, say, the fifth power, all that does is it raises those diagonal entries to the fifth power. So 1 to the fifth is 1. Minus 1 to the 5th is minus 1, and then 3 to the 5th and 2 to the 5th. If we now extend this to diagonalizable matrices, then what we see is the following. First, 
we have a diagonalizable matrix. So A is equal to S, lambda S inverse, where lambda is diagonal. And if I try and do something like compute the square of A, A times A, I get S lambda S inverse times S lambda S inverse. If I regroup these, S inverse times S here is the identity. So it drops out. And what I'm left with, therefore, is an S to the left, an S inverse matrix to the right, and in between, two lambdas, lambda squared. So S lambda squared, S inverse. If I raised A to higher powers, A to the P, where P is 1, 2, 3, etc., I get A, S lambda, S inverse, times S lambda, S inverse, P times. And since all of the S, S inverse terms cancel, what I'm going to be left with is S to the left, S inverse to the right, and lambda to the P in between. And we've just seen how to compute lambda to the P. The formula can actually be generalized. I can take any value p greater than zero and define a to the p as s lambda to the p times s inverse. And when I try and multiply out these terms, I'll find that indeed I will get the answer that I expect. For a to the zero, p equals zero. Well, if I think back about lambda to the zero, power, what I would have is 1 to the 0, minus 1 to the 0, 3 to the 0, and powers of scalars are defined to be 1, so I would get the identity matrix for lambda. And if lambda to the 0th power is the identity matrix, then S identity S inverse multiplies out to the identity. So we'll define A to the 0th power to be the identity. Then if A inverse exists, I can generalize my formula some more and allow a to the p to be s lambda to the p times s inverse, where this time p is negative numbers. One particular case that comes out of this last formula is that if I look at a and compute s lambda s inverse, and now take the inverse of this expansion. The inverse of s lambda s inverse is s times lambda inverse times s again, consistent with the formula that we wrote here. To put a few examples together, consider the following matrix A. It's 6, 6, minus 2, minus 1. That matrix A has the following diagonalization decomposition. And I can now write something like A inverse. A inverse is s lambda inverse s inverse and the inverse of lambda is 2 to the inverse is 1 over 2. The inverse of 3, 3 to the minus 1, is 1 over 3. And when I multiply out this expression here, I indeed get the inverse of the matrix A. Another example would be the square root of A. Since my values here are positive, square roots are positive numbers. If they were negative, I would get imaginary numbers out of it. So a to the one-half power is s lambda to the one-half power times s inverse. Lambda to the one-half power is 2 to the one-half. That's the square root of 2. 3 to the one-half is the square root of 3. And so here is the square root of a matrix. And if I multiply the square root times the square root, it will indeed multiply out to a. So what's our takeaway today? Well. We started out by investigating y is equal to ax with square matrices A. And we showed that if we introduce a change of basis where the S matrix is made up of columns that are our new basis vectors, then what we get is a new transformation, a new representation of that matrix A called A tilde, the similarity transform of A with S, S inverse AS. And that matrix represents the same geometrical transformation. It's just written in a new basis. Next, we found that if we have N linearly independent eigenvectors in Rn, so if all of the geometric multiplicities were equal to the algebraic multiplicities of the eigenvalues that we find, then we can make that matrix A diagonal when we choose that basis. That is, the similarity transformation of A with the coordinate change matrix made up of the columns of our eigenvector basis, that multiplies out to the diagonal matrix lambda. So 
Lambda is the representation of our transformation in that eigenvector basis. And the diagonal entries of lambda, they are the eigenvalues that we found. Next, if I take an arbitrary vector x and I express it in this basis, I write it as a linear combination of the eigenvectors. And I'm guaranteed I can do it since these eigenvectors form a basis for Rn. So there's a unique way of writing x in terms of those eigenvectors. And if I now look at what happens when I transform x with a, a times x therefore applies a to this expansion in the eigenvectors. a distributes over the sum and the scalar multiplication. So I get alpha 1ax1 plus alpha 2ax2, etc. And since the x's are eigenvectors, what that does is that simply multiplies each one of those components by the corresponding eigenvalue. So applying that matrix A to the vector scales each one of the components along each of the eigenvectors by the corresponding eigenvalue. If the eigenvalue happened to be complex, the action is not just a scaling in addition to it, it's a rotation. But here's the picture that goes with it. Here's my vector x. And I conjecture two eigenvectors with eigenvalue lambda equals two. So they define a plane and any one vector in that plane will get scaled by the multiplier two. And a third eigenvector, the blue vector here with eigenvalue three. So that defines a line in three space in this particular example. So if we look at the action of applying that matrix A to the black vector over here. Well, first we have to decompose it. We have to decompose it into the piece that lies in the plane of the lambda equals two time space, plus another component that is parallel to E3, so that I have it written as a vector, as a linear combination of the eigenvectors in the red plane, plus an eigenvector along the blue line. When I apply A to this vector here, the component that lies in the plane gets scaled by 2, and the component that is along E3 gets scaled by a factor of 3. So the overall effect is to scale the component in the E2 subspace by 2, and adding to that the scaled version of the E3 component, multiplying that by 3, and that takes my vector x to my overall end result over here. If the eigenvalue is complex, then there's one further action that's going to happen, namely that a component in, say, if E2, where E2 plus some imaginary part, is that it would take this vector here, it would scale it by the magnitude of that eigenvalue, and then it would rotate it in the plane associated with that eigenvalue. So the complex value would add a rotation to this picture. Overall, then, there are many, many, many applications of this decomposition, of this diagonalization of a matrix A, and the one that we looked at was powers of a matrix, and there are many problems that we can solve given that we know how to compute powers of a matrix.